Hello and welcome to or welcome back to Who Killed Who. Today I am diving into the mysterious death of one of the most iconic women to have ever walked the face of the earth. That is the one and only Marilyn Monroe. But did you know all of the weird circumstances surrounding her death? Let's dive right into these inconsistencies. Born Norma Jean Mortensen in Los Angeles, California, as we know, Marilyn Monroe would go on to become the most glamorous movie star of her time and arguably one of the most captivating iconic women of all time. Her mysterious death at just 36 years old in August of 1962 remains one of Hollywood's most tragic losses. For the last 60 years, the public has analyzed and questioned the circumstances surrounding Marilyn's death. So many believe something is amiss, which has kept rumors and conspiracy theories circulating for six decades. Norma Jean certainly did not have the easiest childhood. Her mother, who suffered from mental illness, was constantly in and out of mental health facilities. Norma Jean's father was completely absent from her life, and the instability she experienced due to that and being paired with her mother's mental illness effectively made Norma Jean an orphan. She was shuffled between nearly a dozen foster homes and orphanages until she married her neighbor in 1942. At just 16 years old, her new husband's name was Jim Daughtery, and he was a police officer. Sadly, she carried the neglect and the abuse that she suffered during her childhood into her adulthood. Norma Jean had always dreamt of becoming an actress since she was a young girl, and these plans, paired with the childhood trauma she was carrying, caused her first marriage to deteriorate after only a few years. Staying true to her dream, she became a model for the local photographers using the name Marilyn Monroe and went on to land roles in several Hollywood classics. While experiencing great success in her professional life, Marilyn's personal life looked much different. She was dealing with rocky marriages and then messy divorces from two well-known figures. Joe DiMaggio, her second husband, was a baseball player, and then her third husband was a playwright, making these relationships and all of their problems very public. Monroe's career started to decline around the time that she was fired from the Century Fox film over constant issues with punctuality. There was no doubt that Monroe had become depressed. The demands of stardom and feelings of abandonment and personal failures were a serious struggle. She was under the constant care of a doctor and a psychiatrist who had prescribed her numerous medications and to treat mental health issues as well as her insomnia. Marilyn was suffering so severely, she even did a stint in a psychiatric facility, very much like her mother, and it had what she described as a very bad effect on her, which I can imagine after all of the trauma of her childhood and then going to the same places that her mother had gone to. She reportedly suffered with substance use disorders, resulting in her abusing alcohol and prescription medicine in her 30s. Allegedly, the drug abuse only escalated in the summer of 1962 as her death unknowingly crept closer. On August 5th, 1962, just three short months after her iconic happy birthday performance for the then present John F. Kennedy, Marilyn Monroe was found dead in her Los Angeles home. She was only 36. When the police arrived to the scene, Marilyn was found naked, lying face down in her bed. A sheet draped over her body, on her nightstand, it was littered with pill bottles, many of them prescribed for sleeping. The phone receiver was still in her hand. Immediately, authorities suspected Marilyn had overdosed, but her closest friends didn't buy it. And according to them, they had just spoken to her earlier that same day. 
They said she seemed upbeat and gave no indication that she felt like ending herself when she hung up the phone. Upon completion of the autopsy and the toxicology report, fatal levels of barbiturates, a type of sleeping pill, was found in her system. The toxicologist determined that Monroe ingested a lethal amount of nebutal, a drug that is used to treat anxiety, as well as a large dose of chloral hydrate, a drug used as a sedative. However, upon closer examination of her stomach contents, there were no identifiable pill fragments in her stomach. But if it wasn't self-inflicted, how did she pass? On August 4th, 1962, Marilyn's housekeeper, Eunice Murray, noticed Monroe's bedroom light on in the early morning hours of August 5th. This struck her as very odd. She called out to Monroe, knocking on the window and trying to turn the handle to open the door, but finding it locked. The housekeeper found this alarming and called Monroe's psychiatrist, Dr. Ralph Greenson, as well as his personal physician, Dr. Hyman Engelberg. Around 3.30 a.m., the psychiatrist arrived at Monroe's house and broke into the bedroom through a window. A few minutes later, Engelberg arrived and pronounced Monroe dead. The coroner's official report listed her cause of death as acute barbiturate poisoning, ingestion of overdose, and probable S-word self-infliction. From the presidential affairs and the CIA cover-ups to mafia involvement and murder, there are some powerful conspiracies surrounding this mystery. The circumstances surrounding the death of Marilyn Monroe are suspicious, especially because the official version of her death fails to account for the discrepancies that might indicate murder. Many of the witnesses who were most involved in the case later recanted some of their original reports. Some alleged that they were forced to participate in a cover-up and have implied that the cover-up was designed to protect President Kennedy and his brother, Attorney General Robert Kennedy. The rumors surrounding Monroe's alleged affair with JFK had been running rampant since her seductive happy birthday performance in May of 1962 in front of 20,000 people at Madison Square Garden. It is now known that Monroe and the president were among overnight guests at the Bing Crosby's house in Palm Springs on that same evening and met on several other occasions. It has also been theorized that Monroe was involved with JFK's younger brother, Robert Kennedy, and for an even longer period of time, possibly maintaining intimate relationships with both of them in the same period of time. People have speculated the ending of the affair between Monroe and the president may have sent her spiraling and ultimately led to her demise. In the days leading up to her death and even the night of, Monroe had several conversations with several people. Mere days before her death, Monroe told her friend, a writer, that if Robert Bobby Kennedy continued to avoid her, I might just have to call a press conference and tell them all about it. In his biography of the deceased star, this very same writer alleged that Robert Kennedy had actually visited Monroe on the day that she passed and spent the night at the home of his brother-in-law, Peter Lawford. Lawford also spoke to Monroe on August 4th. According to him, he and his wife invited Monroe to dinner. When she failed to show up, he called her, noticing that she sounded disappointed and disheartened regarding her career and personal issues. Lawford stated that Monroe's speech was slurred as she told him she was tired and would not be coming to dinner. Then, as her voice faded, Lawford heard Monroe utter those final sentences to him. Say goodbye to Pat, say goodbye to Jack, and say goodbye to yourself because you're a nice guy. He later admitted that he had a very bad feeling that something was wrong, but ignored his instinct according to the police report. He still blames himself for not going to her home himself. 
One of her last phone conversations with her hairstylist took place on August 4th around 9.30 p.m. The actress reportedly told the hairstylist that Bobby Kennedy had come to her home earlier in the day and threatened her. However, Kennedy's visit has been disputed. As attorney John Bates told reporters that the attorney general was in Northern California with his family the entire weekend. Some investigators have gone as far as to suggest the CIA was involved in Monroe's untimely death. This theory originated in the late 1960s. Speculation suggests that the CIA arranged to have Monroe killed due to the fact that she knew too much, making her a threat to national security. Another theory suggests the mafia is responsible for Monroe's death. The mafia was connected to the Kennedys and the relationship was not a positive one. People speculate the mafia killed Monroe as a revenge move to hurt John and Bobby Kennedy. Strangely, in the months before her death, Monroe's phone was tapped by the Justice Department of Robert Kennedy and the agents of the International Brotherhood Teamsters boss, Jimmy Hoffa. This is not speculation. It is a fact backed up by evidence. Was Monroe really a pawn caught between the country's most powerful criminals and politicians? No one knows, but the medical explanation for her death is full of holes. It has also been suggested that the FBI was involved. The Bureau has been accused of hiding key details regarding the night of Monroe's death, such as major discrepancies between the public press releases and the private eyewitness accounts. Another questionable faucet of this case is time. It took an unusually long time to discover Monroe dead, hours for the authorities to arrive and even longer to remove her from the home. Why did the housekeeper call Monroe's doctors instead of the police? Why didn't she break the window herself while she was waiting? Why were there no investigators present when the time of death was called? Were Monroe's own doctors involved? Some believe Monroe's psychiatrist Greenson was actually responsible for creating the version of the story of her death. Most of Greenson's relatives have kept tight-lipped, but Greenson's own widow indicated that her husband kept some details out of the night of Monroe's death from his family so as not to burden them. That burden may forever remain unknown. The controversy surrounding Monroe's passing was so intense that the Los Angeles Police Department reopened her case two decades after her death. Despite further investigation, the district attorney decided that citing overdose as the cause of death was the correct ruling, so nothing changed. The unaliving investigation reported that Monroe swallowed one gulp of around 47 Nebutal pills, but her prescription issued to her by Dr. Engelberg was for only 25 pills. If Monroe had ended herself by swallowing the pills, the residue from their digestion should have been found in her stomach. They weren't. IV use of the drug was suggested, but she had no access to injectable barbiturates. The coroner's report stated that there were no puncture marks on Monroe's body, but Dr. Engelberg's bill to her estate showed that he had given her an injection the day before her death, a mark that should have been clearly visible at the time of the autopsy. This information raises the question, was Marilyn Monroe injected with a fatal amount of drugs, which was later covered up by the coroner? The public was devastated by the death of the young icon with the news of her passing making the front page of newspapers around the entire world. Monroe was widely considered as one of the greatest sex symbols of the 20th century, 
even 60 years later after her passing, she is still highly regarded in the entertainment industry, inspiring movies and documentaries. Her beauty and her glamour remain an important part of pop culture and her image will live on forever.